One of the big differences that I found when I uh, converted to Judaism as opposed to Christianity is that Judaism doesn't seem to celebrate sinners. Like, look at, say, the song Amazing Grace. You know, this is, and, and I think it was written by Isaac Newton. And this guy is celebrated because he used to be a slave trader, but now he's come to Jesus. Yeah, wasn't it Isaac Newton who wrote Amazing Grace? He was the, I know it was written by a slave trader. Uh, that, that is for sure, but it was by Isaac Newton? As in the, no, not, not the physicist. Uh, yeah, his name was Isaac Newton? I didn't know. No, no, no. Was, was Isaac Newton the, the guy who invented physics or like the, the, the apple falling off on his head? Because he was connected to that. Yeah, well, whoever wrote Amazing Grace, he was a, was slave, a slave trader. trader. That's right. Like, and. Judaism, at least as it's practiced today, doesn't seem to celebrate sinners. Like, I can't imagine Judaism, like, extolling, you know, a former slave trader because he came out and wrote, you know, a beautiful song about the ills of... Well, I'd say yes and no. In other words, Judaism extols the Baal Shuba, yeah. meaning the person, you know, who was able to transform their lives and to evolve, Judaism actually extols. I mean, one of the things that's true is we actually don't really believe in Shuba anymore. We actually don't believe in a person's ability to evolve. We always lock people in their place. You know, people run around on Yom Kippur asking forgiveness of all the people they don't need to ask forgiveness from and never speak to any of the people they really need to ask forgiveness from. So we've kind of lost you know, the chart of Shuba. But we absolutely extol right, the Baal Shuba, right, the person who's able to transform. And as a matter of fact, the, the Talmud says, right, greater is the place in which the Baal Shuba, the, tra the person who's engaged in transformation, greater is the place in, that they stand than the place of even the greatest righteous person who never fell and rose again. Except, I mean, but like in Christianity, we used to have like, you know, you'd have a woman stand up says, I was a hooker. You know, and I used to smoke crack, and uh, maybe it's just a different socioeconomic crowd, but you know, I just can't picture a woman standing up at Shaw and saying, I was a hooker, I used to smoke crack, and now I'm an Orthodox Jew. You know, or like I was a you know, massive uh, criminal, I ran with a gang, um, I was a slave trader, I was a pimp, um, I was a pornographer, you know, I was a... Um, Right. You know, these horrible, devious things. Those people don't stand up, you know, in Christianity they go from church to church telling the story of how they were saved from, right. you know, their sins. But Jews don't stand up and elaborate their sins. I think that's you know, right. I think that's, that's an interesting perception. I think that's partially because there's an ethic of modesty. You know, there's an ethic of, of privacy. You know, a person goes through their life and they actually have a right to work out their issues, right, in private. And it's actually not the domain of the community. And in that sense, you know, if a person comes to synagogue, you know, they have a right to actually say, you know, I was, for example, you know, involved in, I don't know, you know, illegal trading that swindled a lot of people out of their old accounts, you know, and I've done shuva for that, and I've repented for that, and I actually get to now come to synagogue and be part of the community. I don't have the obligation, right, to publicly shame myself in front of the community. I have the obligation, right, to seek forgiveness where I can, where it's possible and appropriate. Sometimes it's not possible and not appropriate, but I seek forgiveness where it's possible and appropriate. I do an internal process of committing not to repeat the sin, I regret the previous sin, and I'm back in the story without this kind of public self-abasement, which is very much or public self-flagellation, which just becomes a kind of self-involvement, which is very much not kind of the way of, 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 of the, the Jewish path. I think that's right. Like, I like those Christian stories because I was always more interested when the, before they converted. Like before they converted, they were interesting people. You know, they 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 hoard around. You know, they hooked. They sold their ass on the street. They shot drugs. They shot people. You know, they ran with a bad crowd. Like those were like great stories, man. They were like killing people and like you know mayhem, rape. You know, sleazy behavior, like fascinating stuff. Then you know they start coming to Jesus. You know, and then they start piling on the Bible verses. As when I like to tune out of those stories. I think we may have a different definition of fascinating, my friend Luke. Fascinating is a person who lives their life heroically, right? who lives their life, you know, in a way in which they're able to rise above right, that which might have been their fate 
can transform their fate into destiny and make the world a better place and create service and, and you know, grapple with, you know, ethics and grapple with sexuality and, and try and, you know, write things that are beautiful and try and, you know, create things that allow people to live better lives. I'm not quite sure that rape, mayhem, killing is in and of itself fascinating, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's the pious <laughs> rabbinic thing to say, but I've got empirical proof and on my side. There's a... <clears throat> There's a rea reality TV show called Cops. It's been running for about 15 years. Cops, police officers. Yeah, it? yeah. It's about you know the the misadventure, uh, you know the adventures right. of police. There's no show called Accountants <laughs> or Rabbis or you know uh, Plumbers or it's people who are like life and death stuff is you know inherently exciting and uh, at least to watch. I mean. That, that there's excitement, right? That there's excitement on the edge is absolutely true, right? But excitement on the edge, right? Ultimately, we're not excited by pure decadence. You know, we're excited by an attempt to, for example, come to grips, right? Come to grips to, to move something, to change something. I mean, cops, I've never seen it, right? But police officers are actually, you know, engaging life in order to make the world somewhat a better place. What's true is, is that there's a fascination all the way through the dark side. There's a fascination with the dark side because all of us have shadow, right? And sometimes we disown our shadow, we dissociate from our shadow, and so therefore we have this kind of excessive fascination with other people's shadow because we think, well, if we're watching their decadence, well, it's got nothing to do with us, that's them, right? And, and often the kind of fascination with, you know, I mean, I mean the greatest example was, um, you know, the O.J. Simpson story in America. You know, a huge example. The entire country is fascinated you know, with one man's fury and murder, and the newspapers, you know, report that significantly more than major famines in the world. Because it's more interesting. Um, people, don't, people don't care about what happens in Africa. I think that's not true. I think people do care. I think what happens is it's so large and so beyond people's ability to wrap around that they actually narrow their circle of caring in order not to feel the pain. And it's much easier, right, to kind of follow the story of a particular individual. You know, particularly, we like following the story of a particular individual, O.J. Simpson, you know, was highly successful and then kind of falls into this kind of murderous rage, you know, and apparently becomes a murderer. So there's a fascination in that story. But fascination per se, right, isn't enough. You know, fascination per se is, you know, I consider in front of the TV, I watch horror movies all day, but I'm never going to grow. I'm never going to evolve, and I'm never going to experience true pleasure. But that has nothing to do with rabbinic piety, my friend. True pleasure comes from growth. True pleasure comes from genuine engagement. I can sit glued in front of the TV, fascinated, right, with, you know, decadence, you know, and murder, but that's actually not going to give me pleasure. It's just going to dull my mind. It's going to atrophy my soul, and ultimately, I'm going to feel dead and decadent as opposed to alive, joyful, and pleasurable. Wait, that sounds like the, what, the 49 levels of pleasure is articulated by Noah Weinberg? I don't know about Noah Weinberg, but in the Musser movement, in the Musser movement, it, which is where Rabbi Weinberg was emerging from in the second and third generation of the Musser movement, there was a lot of writing about what's true pleasure. Uh, right? So that's that's where it comes from. Uh, yeah. Actually, Tamar Ross wrote her doctorate, Professor Tamar Ross right, right. wrote a beautiful doctorate which I, I read many, many years ago, the four or five hundred pages, where it cited a lot of this material, and then I began reading Rabbi Israel Salanter and some of his major students who talk extensively about what's the nature of pleasure. So what you're correct in saying is, is that Rabbi Weinberg is in some sense emerging out of that Musser moment school, and what he did is he translated those questions you know, into a kind of you know, more contemporary idiom and did a wonderful job of doing it. But the source of this is a very strong strain in second and third generation Musser, which is about what's true onik, what's true pleasure, what's really pleasurable, what's not really pleasurable. So that's a very, very powerful Hebraic idea. Now, was Noah Weinberg, is he the founder of Asian Torah? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I believe so. Jesus, slow down. Christ. Sorry. I'm a bit of a nervous Nelly. Wow. Okay, we almost died live on my cam. <laughs> Luke Ford. He's punishing me. He's punishing me for those things I read about him. If 
or those inaccurate things that thank God he's finally starting to change. But in his last moments, as the car crashes, Luke's gonna say, forgive me, forgive me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I've sinned. No. Ah! <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your old religion, Luke. We're trying to stay in the contemporary one. You know what I mean? 